It is a, a great pleasure to be here and uh, happily uh, so many of the issues that are raised in this book are uh, really joined at the hip with uh, the work that we're doing at the Lincoln Institute and uh, Mac with your leadership um, we're, uh, we're meeting some of those challenges and I'll talk about that uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, so here's the book, uh, and what I'd like to do is start out by showing a few images, um, beginning in my neighborhood of uh, uh, Brookline, another apartment building just down the street from my home. We all recognize this in, uh, in Boston. This is in Harvard Square. Boston City Hall, of course, which the late Tom Menino uh, told me w at one time would make a great handball court. <laughs> Just around the corner here at uh, Riverview, uh, apartment building uh, on Mount Auburn Street. This is a nail wife, but it, re it really could be anywhere uh, with its uh, horizontal strip windows and uh, uh, a typical uh, typology of the uh, corporate office park. Does anyone know where this is? Fall River City Hall, quite similar to Boston City Hall. And this is in Providence. And finally, uh, again, in, in Back Bay, right here in Boston, uh, the John Hancock Tower. Well, what I hope to illustrate that uh, so much of our landscape, for better or worse, all around us, has been influenced by this man, Le Carbusier, born Charles Edouard Genere in 1887 in the watchmaking town of Le Chaudefond, Switzerland. He moved to Paris uh, at uh, about the time of the Roaring Twenties and rebranded himself with the single moniker. It's taken from a family name but loosely translates as well to the Raven, the mythic uh, acrobatic bird of Celtic lore. And he set out to revolutionize design space, the way we live and the way we inhabit cities. He's one of the first to marshal the power of public relations and I argue was the original star architect, a founding father of modern architecture. Uh, though in the US arguably the better known figure was Frank Lloyd Wright. The two men were rivals, uh, though Wright actually rebuffed Le Carbusier's offer to meet in person. Uh, it's as if uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was Bill Gates and uh, Le Carbusier was Steve Jobs. Incidentally, a little known fact is that uh, the uh, initial uh, submission for the Guggenheim was actually by uh, Le Carbusier. Uh, he provided a sketch of continuous ramps uh, but the building was square. The architect, the creator of the built environment, has such enduring appeal today with figures such as Frank Gehry, Rem Koolhaas, Renzo Piano, Zaha Hadid, and I'd like to make the case that Le Carbusier was truly a pioneer. He was a, an original disruptor, pragmatic, opportunistic, and fundamentally non-ideological in the conventional sense. He was a master of reinvention, working in his atelier, the equivalent of a startup in a garage, uh, experimenting, challenging the status quo, and expertly, if rather assertively, delegating the execution of his vision to a loyal team. In Modern Man, I've sought to write a narrative biography of genius to get inside his head a little bit, try to figure out what makes him tick and what drove him. It's a bit like what I might do, and indeed would long to do, and that's why I had a biography of Tom Brady, uh, and look at uh, what it's like to be in that pocket, uh, to make those split decisions, and to perform on such a grand stage. But here, I'm writing that narrative about an architect. My first books uh, were about telling stories centered on uh, urban planning and cities and architecture and urban design. The gambit has always been to bridge the world of the think tank, academia, and journalism and narrative nonfiction. Um, there have been many books about Le Carbusier. 
they, they are mostly divided up into specialties. So uh, there's a book about the architect in the beach. There's a book about the churches he built, about him growing up in Switzerland, about his time here in America. Modern Man is not a scholarly treatise. There's uh, plenty of that in the literature to date. My goal was to give uh, Le Carbusier the wrestling with Moses treatment, that is, aimed at a general audience, and for many readers who actually might have little idea who he was. Well, uh, our hero would always lecture without notes, doing a kind of PowerPoint on the fly, uh, writing with uh, charcoal on uh, reams of newsprint like this. I've structured the book so the story of his life is not so much a linear or chronological uh, tale, but rather an exploration of themes uh, and uh, rooms in the memory palace, if you will. In my own modest way, I've sought to design the narrative a bit like one of Le Carbusier's buildings, uh, unfolding a process of theatrical discovery. Well, to give you a sense of his early influences, le, uh, let us take uh, a, a journey back in time, beginning with Le Chaux de Fonds, Switzerland, where he was born. It's a remote place, uh, and he was eager to get out of there pretty much as quickly as possible, uh, much like uh, the city's other famous son, Louis Chevrolet, uh, the founder of uh, the giant car company. The city did have great influence. Uh, it was destroyed by fire in the late uh, 18th century. It was rebuilt with an orderly street grid and buildings set at regular distances apart, similar to those in Hausmann's Paris, allowing abundant light to shine into the top floor ateliers, which is where the watchmaking was done. Le Chaux de Fond, uh, was the origin of such leading brands that we know today, uh, including Breitling and Movado. It was clear from early on that this young man uh, had a talent for drawing and conveying the visual. In the local art school, he studied under the master Charles Le Platinier, who encouraged him to give architecture a try. His father wanted him to follow in his footsteps and engrave watch cases, uh, a destiny that was made impossible in part because of a condition that essentially left him blind in one eye. Le Chaux de Fonds was where he built his first villas, Villa Fallet, Villa Schwab, a theater, and ultimately this terrific house on the outskirts uh, that he built for his parents um, up on a hill, Maison Blanche. Uh, it's open to, for tours to this day, and as you walk inside, though it was completed in 1912, uh, it's clear how truly modern it is. That's his father George's boater and cane hanging in the hallway. Maison Blanche ended up being a bit too much house for his parents, and he ended up designing another place for their retirement, Villa Le Lac, or uh, the Petite Maison on the shores of Lake Geneva, in Veve on the Swiss Riviera. Uh, that, by the way, is uh, the adopted hometown of uh, Charlie Chaplin, as well as Nestle headquarters. There's going to be all kinds of uh, fun facts that are, are for great use at cocktail parties as a result of this lecture. <laughs> Here the minimalist uh, and efficient modern design is seen in full flourish. Um, it featured a hideaway bed, uh, a compact kitchen. Uh, it's really something that you might see in a showroom in Ikea uh, today. Uh, it's where Marie, his mother, who outlived his father by many uh, decades, could wash the dishes and watch the boats go by. Not content to provide any ordinary back patio as well, uh, the faithful son installed this feature on the left, framing the landscape of lake and mountains. As a young man, encouraged by his master, uh, Le Platinier, he hit the road with a friend for the equivalent of a European backpacking tour, drinking in uh, the monasteries of Italy, which would influence his housing design, and the ultimate mesmerizing destination, the Acropolis, which instilled in him a flair for the monumental. There's never a question that he had to be in Paris. He talked his way into an internship with the Paray brothers, who were experimenting with the use of concrete at the time, and also interned uh, with Peter Behrens, who with Walter Gropius and uh, uh, another intern at about the same time, Mies van der Rohe, 
uh, of course, helping establish the German design school, the Bauhaus.